Uh, so my name is Annie Bailey, and I am going to be presenting on engaging millennials as parents. So um, I'm, I'm going to be covering a lot of information in about 30 minutes, and I'll take the last 10 minutes or so uh, for questions, discussion, anything like that. Um, so I, Brent Colby and I co-wrote this chapter in the Fusion book, the second book, and I did my master's thesis um, on the topic of mentoring millennial, mentoring millennial leaders um, using coaching. And so this, this is something I've been researching and working with millennials for the past 10 years. And just noticing, some of this has come about and noticing that um, churches, that there's this gap between generations, whether it's in communication or just engaging um, this younger generation, which maybe a few years ago was in high or college age, but now there are parents in our churches um, and young adults. And so today I wanna talk to you about millennials from that point of view of really how to engage them effectively as parents. Um, a lot of you, if you're on social media, read business journal articles, probably every week there's a different article about, you know, 10 reasons why millennials are leaving your church or 10 ways, you know, to get them back in church or this or that. And there's some that are great and have good information, but a lot of them give you what's wrong and don't really give you any tools to how do I engage them? How do I fill in the real gaps in, in relationship or fill in the communication gaps? And some of them, some of those articles really paint like millennials are this golden generation and everyone has to kind of bend to make anything work around them which they're a great generation but they're also like the generations before them and it's and I'm so what I want to talk to you today is not just how can you engage millennials and make them the center of attention of your church but how can you engage them so they can be um, part of the whole of your church and effectively communicate and engaging them. So just a disclaimer when I talk about this is that when we talk about large groups of people, we're talking about generalizations. When we take those broad generalizations and start applying them to individuals, that's called stereotyping. And so there's a fine line, right? So we want to take these, this information with broad strokes, understanding that not every single one of these is going to apply to every millennial you know. And just like we know that everyone from the South doesn't have a southern accent everyone's not waving a confederate flag the same <laughs> the same applies for millennials but a lot of these things that I'm going to be talking about that you can go to just about any piece of literature um, and find that this will ring true about millennials so what I want to do is give you a brief snapshot about millennials on your handout that I gave you um, I broke down and gave you a little profile of the baby boomers and the gen xers um, I kind of geeked out over this. <laughs> this stuff's really interesting. I had to really uh, sift it down to the essentials. I could have kept going back to like the traditionalists, which is like early 1900s, but I had to stop and I realize I have like 25 minutes to talk to you about this. So, but I am a firm believer that unless we really understand, like I can tell you about millennials, but the story, there's a story in, in this and in that this goes back generations to when we understand the traditionalists, which is the early 1900s to about 1945, and kind of their family values, the world they grew up in, um, what they passed on, the world they created for the baby boomers, which you can see here. Um, we see that the boomers' values, they went from their parents, which was doing things for the greater good, the people who lived for, um, through the Great Depression, World War II, um, those world events, uh, the baby boomers became very self-focused. And so that self-focused world that their parents kind of created for them um, shaped the next generation and how they would act, the decisions that they would make, how they would value family. And so we know that with baby boomers, by their name, this was a generation, people from the traditionalist generation, they came back from World War II and said, let's settle down and have babies, and have babies they did. So we have this generation, tons of kids, um, baby boomers, it was a highly competitive generation. They had to kind of fight for what they wanted. It was very materialistic. There was a lot of affluence in that generation. 
And so that was the first generation to really take faith and start saying, this isn't about just this denomination and my loyalty to this denomination, but started questioning. They've been exposed now to Eastern religions because of World War II. And, you know, this world that I thought was really dependable, maybe it's not. And so started questioning, uh, questioned organizations. They started buying. They thought happiness would be found in like homes and possessions. And they stopped valuing family like their parents did. So they had fewer kids. And they really tried to prolong um, youth longer. And so then we saw them having fewer kids, which then was the Gen X, Generation X. And so that generation is the smallest generation in a while. Um, this generation uh, grew up lots of divorces, latchkey kids, you know, missing kids on milk cartons. They grew up as a very cynical generation. There were a lot of things going wrong. They had to live through a couple recessions. So the Generation X, those are people between 1965 and 1979, that age group. So raise your hand if you were a boomer in here. Gen X, millennial, which is anything after 1980. Okay, so a lot of Gen Xers in here. And so you know the world you grew up in. So a lot of Generation X, they kind of did things on their own timeline. They didn't, things weren't really stable in the economy. So instead of trying to settle down and buy a home, they said, hey, let's go travel. Um, we're gonna, their values shifted significantly. And even with faith, no longer did they take it at face value or just dive into theology, but they said, hey, what will this pragmatically, will this work for me? And I'm not going to buy into it unless it actually works. Um, they were also the first generation that really wanted community. So because of a lot of divorces, um, their families moving around, they also were the first generation to find their friends as their family. So you know that TV show Friends? That was classic of people of Generation X, you know, for talking in broader generalizations. So they really love community, but they want the kind of community um, in church even that's going to be longer term. So they'll go to small groups, but they don't want the small groups to end after eight weeks. They want something that's going to be more consistent. So then with family, this generation, generation X, they knew how they weren't necessarily highly valued by their parents. So they said, we want to have a family and family matters to us. So they had a lot of kids. And so that's why the millennials are as big of a generation as they are, because the generation X, they had a bunch of kids and really valued being good parents. So now we are at the millennial generation. And here is a snapshot of what they look like. Um, they're the first generation to come of age in the millennium since 2000. So we're talking about 1980 to 2000, people born in that age range. They are children of Gen Xers, really late baby boomers as well. And they make up one third of the population in the United States. So a lot of the statistics that um, I'm talking about have come from studies that have pulled primarily in the United States. They are... Um, they have also come from a diverse population, so it's not just white people, but a lot of these really more ring true with Caucasian um, races or nationality. Um, they are the most educated generation yet. They're very civic-minded, morally tolerant. Um, they're, they were born into an overly busy, fast-paced, ever-changing society, so they're super adaptable. So. You maybe you've heard that like millennials like to multitask. You know they have their phone out. They're trying to have a conversation. They're trying to also do this, which they say we can do it all. And we know that studies have shown that we can't really multitask and do things effectively. But this is the first ge generation who who can be so adaptable and adept at things that they can sure try and pull it off halfway. Um, the family has shifted significantly. Lots are waiting longer to get married. They've created kind of this prolonged uh, developmental years of, of adulthood. So a lot of them think that they don't actually become adults till they're 26. And so if some parents are like, 
my 25 year old still living with me, why are they still here? <laughs> well, never mind, they're thinking, you know, I wanna figure out who I am. That takes a while. And then out of that decision, that out of that knowledge, then I'll settle down, then I'll buy a house, then I'll find the right job and, you know, my dreams will be fulfilled. Where before, in past generations, people were getting married at 23, 20 years old. Uh, millennials are getting married at 29 and 27 for men and women, respectively, and having kids around that age as well. So it's not uncommon for millennials to be having like kids at 30, 34. <laughs> so when uh, past generations are like, my kids were almost grown by 34, these millennials are just starting to think about, okay, I'm ready to settle down and have a family. So what's that next step? Um, so also the family and values has shifted as well in that 10% live together before they get married. 24% um, buy a house together before they get married. And marriage is not even on the top two for what will make like them happiest. So if you ask, you know, what's one of your life goals? What's one of the most important things to you? Having a happy marriage is not in the top two. Being a good parent is the number one thing, however. They, and so this is important for you guys as children's pastors, children's leaders to understand that whatever family dynamics is going on, that they care about being good parents. And that's exciting for you in that you have potentially really invested parents. How that plays out could be exciting or really annoying depending on how involved they are in differing strategies or whatever, right? But so what I want to talk to you for about the next 15 minutes are five overarching values or principles or characteristics of millennials. Um, the first one is that they need authenticity. So as I'm talking about these, you can kind of, I want you to picture what millennial do you know who's a parent who's involved in your church. I want you to like really think through who's someone that I could apply this to because that's where we're talking about like an, more of an abstract 20,000 foot idea of generations and overarching characteristics. But what will matter is when y if you can really take this information and walk out the door and apply it, that's going to be, that's going to change things for you. Um, so the first thing is their need for authenticity. So some of the basic stats information, um, they value authenticity in their relationships, in their organizations, in their work. You name it, they want authentic. That's kind of a buzzword we hear around, whether that's talking about art, tattoos, like all these forms of self-expression. It's my authentic self. If I just want you to be authentic, I'm saying, I want you to just be yourself. Um, we can see this, like I said, in their tattoos, where maybe with boomers, it, you were rebellious if you got a tattoo, or maybe you were in the military or a biker gang or something. <laughs> now, like as millennials, this is a form of self-expression. This is who I am, and this tattoo reflects that. It's, it, it's kind of ironic, given how significant and important um, authenticity is to millennials, is that if you look at social media, social media is actually the exact opposite. It's this absolutely inauthentic experience in relationships. It's this almost competition, this unspoken competition of putting my best picture out. My, I want to create this, this idea of my perfect life that's happening. So it's a very inauthentic experience on social media. But then in relationships, they have this like almost inborn radar for fakeness. So if I'm just trying to be really cool and try to act like them, but that's not true to who I am, they are gonna sniff it out in a heartbeat and you are gonna lose credibility, credibility with them instantly. So as a leader, and I'll talk about leadership a little bit more later, this actually can work in your favor. So they don't need you to be cool or the trendiest person on earth. They need you to be yourself and try to be relatable and human. So that what they want and what they're craving, they wanna know that you are working through the same struggles as they are. Maybe you're 10, 15 years down the line, but that's great because they want your input or they're open to hearing what struggles you have because they're trying to navigate this and they're definitely more honest about that they don't have this figured out. So as parents, you have a bunch of parents who are 
trying to figure it out as they go and they really want to be involved or they really care about their kids um, but they don't want they don't need you to pretend like you have it all together um, another thing is that they see the church as they don't see the church as an escape from the community they s see the church as a launching point into the community so this whole idea of the church needs to be who they say they are so if jesus's message is to feed the poor take care of the widows be compassionate and loving and kind that's what they want to be part of and that's what they expect and so that that's the measure that of your ministry, of your personal ministry, of your church's ministry, they're aligning with what you're saying we're about, with what you're actually doing. The second, uh, the second characteristic is moral tolerance. And if there is one thing you really need to understand about millennials, it's this. Because this is the value system that has been created for them since they were born. And basically kind of this overarching cultural philosophy that they're living by is that it's that the rules of engagement of life is built on tolerance. We can see that in the media. And so if you're a Christian, there's lots of ways you can interpret that maybe. But at the end of the day, they care about people. So millennials are highly relational, highly relational. So tolerance has a lot to do with relationship. They care about how people are treated. So they were raised in a world where tolerance is the highest good. And this is really an effect of postmodernism. Postmodernism says, how can I really know anything's true? So that's the world they grow up on versus the Bible's true or the Quran's true or etc. right? So they have this world of, endless information. They don't know how to like <laughs> choose, is this true or that's true? In fact, over 35% of millennials say they don't know what makes something true. So that doesn't necessarily mean they can't recognize when something's true, but the value system on what makes something true is very foggy for them. So their morals are based on the foundation of maintaining social harmony rather than truth. So what's right for me is truth, is my truth, like little t, truth, what's right for you is truth. But overall, to say that something is absolutely true, um, most of them would say, I'm not ready to do that, you know, or that could be you're being judgmental. And so that is probably maybe the number one sin is being judgmental among millennials. Um, so we see this, we see this moral tolerance in how they act so being good citizens being good people we see this in how they care for the environment right so even with the lgbtq community in embracing them just because they were to to say hey we should close the gap so they have the same rights that doesn't mean that they agree that morally that those decisions are right but they're saying how they're treated that it needs to be equal and fair um, so how all of this interacts with their faith. So the personal verse, truth, excuse me, the personal truth versus the absolute truth. For their faith, this means that a lot of them are more willing to belong before they believe. So this is great. So if they're, say their kids are coming to your children's ministry program, but their parents aren't Christians, and that can happen quite a bit, is create space for them to serve, to be involved, even if they're not a believer. Find something that maybe um, doesn't involve discipling other people, but it's more of a service so they can be involved because you can build relationship that way. And that's probably the best way that you are going to lead a millennial to Christ is just through relationship. Um, additionally, millennials won't reject truth. And I was talking about truth a minute ago is that it's not that they're opposed to truth, but they care about how truth is handled. So if they feel that you're more concerned about this black and white issue than you are about the people it affects, they will walk away. So they want to see a truth that's handled with love and grace rather than condescension and exclusion. So it really matters how we communicate what truth is to millennials and their kids. And additionally, they have a high bar for discipleship. So 
um, I've heard people say, you know, like try to water it down for millennials, make it easy for them to come. But really, they want, they are a cause driven generation. Most of us want to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves. But this generation, they love a cause. And uh, when you, when they really click with the message of the gospel, that's what they want to live for. They want to join something and be a part of something, be part of Jesus who's saying, lay down your cross and follow me. It's not about convenience, but they want to be something, part of something real. The third thing is uh, spiritual independent. They're spiritually independent, but relationally dependent. So this has, this is a two pronged deal is that they're spiritually independent. They view their spirituality as a journey and they, uh, they view it as something very personal. So they're not going to feel pressured into following Christ. They're not going to feel pressured into going to church or being a certain religion or faith or whatever. And they might not always be really open and initiate those conversations. However, they are very open spiritually. And that's kind of a misconception with millennials that people think that they're like anti-religion, anti-God. That's not the case. They're really open spiritually. However, they are not that interested in church. They're not just going to be part of an organization to be part of something. Um, They are relationally dependent. They need community. I mentioned that earlier. They really need community. They want that. So even with parents, if you can create places for your parents, your millennial parents to come and be a part of something, engage in relationship, engage in community, they're going to be more likely to be part of that and like I said before belonging before believing like a lot of them will be part of something before they make a decision to follow Christ Um, they need time and so when you're planning ministry when you're planning programs which are not all bad to have a program based ministry but be sure you create intentional times for them to connect and build relationships with people they love older people speaking to their lives they love building those relationships so really be intentional about that piece and create a culture of grace and love in your um, in your ministry the fourth characteristic is leaders as facilitators and implementers so be a guide not a guru And so what I mean by that is, again, going back to authenticity, they want you and need you to be authentic. They don't want you to feel, they don't want to feel like you're putting on a show as a leader, that you have it all together, just be yourself. But they also want to come alongside. They want to be a part. So millennials grew up in teams, right? Not just on their uh, sports teams, but even in school, they did a lot of group work, very team oriented. They don't like conflict, but they want to be a part. So this is a great time, especially because now they're in their 20s and 30s. They're starting to get around the block a little bit, gain some knowledge and wisdom. They're incredibly innovative, incredibly creative. While they might be young, they have a really clear, they're looking at the world kind of differently than maybe older generations. And this can work to your advantage. So give them a seat at the table to have an input and and, uh, have a voice. Um, Mentor them. They're really open to mentoring. I talk to a lot of younger millennial age people who would love to have a mentor, but again, they want someone they're going to click with. They want it to be an authentic experience, but but they are kind of waiting for the older people to take the lead and invite them. And so I have to tell them a lot, like, you might just have to go find someone (laughs) that you think could speak into your life and ask them because sometimes older people, they came from a generation where there were those, uh, the the relationship dynamics might have been different. So they they might not think you even want them in your life. So older people, and I'm just talking about anyone older than millennials, like, don't be afraid to, if you see a young leader or someone who has a lot of potential, or you think you could click with, invite them to be part of your ministry, but even in your life, say, hey, let's go grab coffee, or I'm going for a walk, do you want to come? You know, and it's out of those natural conversations that they'll jump in and make time for. But they will be better, you will be better, and that's just a great move, a leadership move for you. Um, 
and then align family development towards their desires and needs as parents. Figure out what they want and need as parents and try to align things to benefit them and their families. Um, the last characteristic is that they're digital natives, and we all know that. We, I mean, there's that, that idea of the appendage, right, that uh, every millennial has a phone in their hand that they're not willing to let go of, even maybe as parents, but they're savvy. They're tech savvy. They've been in this world of technology since they came out of the womb, so if you are not a tech savvy person or kind of want to up your game or think creatively about how you're communicating, get some input from some from some of your millennial parents. They would, I'm sure, gladly give it to you, and that will benefit everyone involved. Think through in your communication methods, too, with technology. What means are you using? Are you using email? Are you using Facebook messages? It's how are you using social media, especially with millennial parents? Because sometimes what you're using as the means to your communication says more about you than what you're actually saying especially with millennials. Some strengths involved with them being digital natives is that, again, like I said, their technological adeptness. They're super savvy. They have this unique set of skills. They see technology differently. They grew up in this generation where they can start a business using two different apps on their phone, uh, where before it would have taken, <laughs> you know, it's a much longer process. Some drawbacks, and this is where a lot of hangups uh, are, at, are in communication is because of this, I'm just gonna text someone a message or Facebook them or whatever, is that um, sometimes they have underdeveloped communication skills that previous generations don't have, or that they do have, rather. So just be aware of maybe they might feel, if they, you're sensing in communication it feels awkward, it might be because it actually is awkward. <laughs> uh, because the millennials really aren't great at face-to-face -face communication. And then that's something they have to learn. So that's something you can kind of gently help them with. But as well, especially when it comes to conflict, that could be a sense, uh, a point of contention. If you're trying to communicate or navigate through some conflict, they might want to text you about it, which might seem really inappropriate given the context of the conversation or the subject. Uh, the last uh, drawback of being digital natives is um, that they might have unrealistic expectations. So they're used to having all this information at their fingertips. You know, they can just Google something at the drop of the hat. They can microwave something, fast food. They think the world is just going to happen. Um, and they're very optimistic, which optimism is good but they don't have the insight or t and understanding to know that you might have to work at a job for two years before you get a promotion or you know the rate of change isn't going to happen in three months because very little change ac actually happens in three months regardless of the technology available the human condition we're still humans so those are things that you might you might face in your interactions with them on the back of your handout, I listed some questions. And, um, and I want to take some time for some questions for you. Uh, but I want you, read, you to read through these. And these are things that you can take home. And answering these questions will really help you take this information and apply it. And that takes work, it takes some time, but get a group of people. If, you're, if, you, if there's some nuggets from this that you're like, yeah, I need to change some things or I can improve some things with millennials, get some people together and have those discussions um, in your ministry so you can apply these. Um, things like, what do you need to stop doing to more effectively reach the millennials? What do you need to start doing? How can you communicate more effectively? What does it mean to be an authentic leader? Like some of those questions, like to really apply and reflect, what does that mean for me? So any questions that you guys might have about any of this? Yeah. The kids aren't or the parents aren't? The kids and the parents. They grow up and they text them like physically or at home. And uh, that's a very important point. <laughs> yeah. uh, the parents don't know what the kids do or where they are. And that's basically the same way I'm talking to the kids. Well, where are you going? What do you do? 
Right. Which is kind of a very popular parenting style right now. Like, let the kids figure out their own punishment. Let them figure out their own faith and all figure it out. And Like, family's a democracy. We'll just let them explore. And exploring's good, but <laughs> the kids don't know anything. This is their first time through being that age, right? So, um, yeah, those are good questions. So one thing I found... And it's not an exciting answer, and there are probably, you know, I would love to hear other people's input, but one thing with um, when you're trying to establish truth and get buy-in with truth is that stuff takes time. And so I, would, I don't know that there's like a quick answer to be like you could go back, have one conversation, and everything is going to reconcile. But I would say to even start like building conversations with that parent and asking questions. And questions are really powerful. Uh, tools because it gets people to think for themselves so that parent he he might not know what truth is for themselves but for him but if you can ask him questions even putting that back on him like well how do you determine what's true you know he might go home and actually think through that and asking provo provoking questions of well, I don't know what is true. And then who knows, you can follow that with, well, what do you think about Jesus? Or whatever that question, like the Holy Spirit gives us good questions to ask. But I would say putting that back on those parents and asking them questions. What are some other insights that you guys might have too that you found successful um, in a scenario like that? Anyone? So I would, yeah, I mean, I, I clearly don't have all the answers. I do know in my experience with millennials, though, regardless whether the parents are not, asking questions is really powerful. And then as you have those relationships, to speak into those because they're really open. But it's, it might take a little while to figure out what is true and develop, like, those critical thinking skills. And that is a characteristic. If you look at almost any study, like coming out of high school and college, that millennials tend to, as a generation, have really undeveloped critical thinking skills because they have all this information, but there wasn't any teaching on how do I decide what is good information, what's bad information, can I even make that determination? And so that's kind of this cultural predicament they are in as parents now. They're like, we'll let our kids figure it out, you know? So any other questions? Yeah. Um, you kind of talked about family, and I know the focus is family, uh, but looking at the three groups, is there something that you found with your research and studies that it doesn't matter what generation you're from or who you like or similarity between all of them? Is there kind of this kind of thing that you can yeah, yeah. Yeah. through and call to attention? Yeah, so. That's a good question. I think some of the things that are going to be are just human nature things, you know, like everyone needs relationship. What that will look like for every generation, you know, might be different, but finding those on ramps into everyone needs relationship, everyone is going to have a point where they ask those hard questions like, what is my life really about? You know, I think that you can see that in every generation is every generation, like, because we're humans and we wonder about our existence, <laughs> there's those dark night of the soul seasons, even for people who don't believe in God or, ha or maybe think of God as this, you know, who knows what he is way out there. But everyone has really hard times. And that's when we, if we're paying attention that to what is going on and finding out what is going on in people's stories that we can come alongside and speak in and just pray. I mean, it's the simple things, really. It's not anything fancy, but those commonalities are, you know, relationship. What is God, where is God at work in all of these things and our just basic need. So, yeah. Any other questions? We can wrap up. Okay. If you guys want any of my notes beyond this, I have really detailed notes. If you want any additional information, you can email me on the bottom of this form is my website, my email address. 
Um, I would gladly give you any resources I have. I have business cards up here. So thank you guys for coming. I hope it was beneficial.